to the uh, witnesses. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I noticed uh, about the Dobbs decision was that in order to get where the justices in favor of that decision wanted to go, they had to change the legal standard from a balancing of interests to history and tradition. Um, in a balancing of interests, one of the interests is the interest of the woman involved in the procedure. In history and tradition, you go back to ancient history, before women had rights, like the right to vote, like the right to have credit without the permission of their husband. It looked like the rights of women were being deliberately removed from the equation by the justices of the Supreme Court. And in that context, Ms. Zorowski, how did it feel to you? How did you feel that your rights, your interests were being considered as you went through the experience that you had to? I felt I had absolutely no right to make a decision for my own body, um, for my own health, for the health of my child. Um, you know, I thought about when my grandfather was in the hospital, similarly also had sepsis, and my dad and his siblings were making the decision on how, how he should receive health care and what kind of treatment he should receive. And what I couldn't understand in those three days where I had to sit and wait to get health care is how is it that my dad was able to make health care decisions for his dad, but I couldn't make my own health care decisions for myself and for the child that was inside me. I had no right, I had no opportunity, and neither did my health care team. In addition to... Um changing the legal standard to get the result they wanted. Uh, the other thing that stuck out uh, for me in that decision was Justice Alito's language that Roe versus Wade, and I'll quote him here, was egregiously wrong from the start. So presumably that means the start back in 1973. Well, after that start, while Roe was egregiously wrong, Alito came before this committee. And he had the chance to tell us that he thought Roe was egregiously wrong, make that observation about that case, and instead he hid that sentiment. He said instead Roe versus Wade is an important precedent of the Supreme Court. It was decided in 1973, so it has been on the books for a long time. It is a precedent that has been on the books for several decades. It has been challenged. It has been reaffirmed. No egregiously wrong. Everything designed to reassure us that he was not going to overturn that decision. So looking back, he looks a lot like a sleeper agent predetermined to attack Roe, who wouldn't disclose what he was up to until he had the majority that he needed to change the legal standard and destroy the legal precedent. Um, I think it's a very unfortunate episode in the Supreme Court's history. Dr. Verma, um, one of the groups I've heard the most from about this in Rhode Island has been OBGYN doctors who express real horror at what this means for their practice, particularly in circumstances where a pregnancy has begun to go wrong, where there are very difficult decisions that have to be made that balance the life of one uh, fetus against perhaps another if it's twins, against risk to the mother. And uh, in that context, um, they view these laws as forcing decisions and disabling them from making decisions that are customary medical practice. Could you comment on that and what some of the circumstances are that you consider to be most dangerous with regard to uh, these laws? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. I can tell you as the OBGYN on this panel who provides full spectrum care, including 
labor and delivery and abortion care that these laws are creating huge amounts of confusion on the ground and preventing people from accessing the health care that they need. We train for years and years to be able to look at the person in front of us and to make the best health care decisions with them and their families. And we're seeing that many people with high-risk pregnancies are not able to get the abortion care that they need. You've heard a couple examples of people that break their water um, before the baby's able to survive outside of them. I also take care of people with medical conditions like really high blood pressure, where um, continuing the pregnancy puts them at risk for things like stroke and preeclampsia. We see people with um, peripartum cardiomyopathy, where the pregnancy causes their heart to enlarge and weaken, and the risk of happening that having that happen again in another pregnancy is quite high. For all of these people were having to to ask ourselves how sick do they have to get to be able to intervene instead of just being able to provide the best medical care for the person in front of us uh, we're having to figure out can I do this under the law and that's creating huge amounts of confusion and absolutely preventing people from getting the care that they need thanks mr. chairman I'd like to ask unanimous consent to let uh, statements from some of Rhode Island's OBGYN doctors be uh, admitted into the record without objection